I'm the CTO of Life Sciences for EMC. Uh, I'm not a storage person. I came from uh, many, many years in healthcare and many, many years in the life sciences. I used to be an FDA uh, computer systems uh, validation verification inspector for a couple of years, so I take a very serious approach to this. I don't blog, by the way. I run my own email server. Uh, so I'm, I, I take this stuff very seriously. So I have a couple of slides on the context of what we're trying to talk here. And we'll try and go for this. Pardon my moving around here. So, um, so this is a completely left field uh, introduction. So imagine the world uh, in about 20 years uh, when uh, your primary care physician is going to be a machine. And this is actually happening today. Um, so you will not have a primary care physician, but you'll be a physician advisor sitting somewhere in the world uh, looking probably at their whole genome data. And uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie Gattaca, but uh, Gattaca is a somewhat scary side of that story, um, but it is becoming reality. So as soon as you're born, you, uh, you get your AFCAR test, you know, medical people in the audience, you get a deal brick, and they figure out if you have a couple of things going on with you. A part of that deal brick now is going to be a whole genome sequence uh, to try and figure out what uh, possible illnesses you may get in the future. Uh, that is both good and scary. So what I'm trying to introduce here is uh, the scary part. I mean, we're talking about security here. So if you, uh, if you dream it, there's probably five guys thinking about it today. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, context. Uh, I have to get her name. Her first name is Rebecca. She works at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, she's an artist. She's a forensic artist. And uh, when I talk about incidental DNA connect collection, she goes around New York City uh, uh, taking swabs out of uh, door handles and uh, cigarette butts that people have put on the street and chewing them. And then she reconstructs the face of the person just based on the DNA uh, sequence. So uh, in fact, the scarier part is there was an article published by Erasmus University in December 2012. This was Northern Europeans. That if you look at a genome sequence, you cannot infer the facial structure of this person. Uh, and you can see where all the military and security applications of this are going. So that is incidental DNA collection. Incidental gene therapy. Let's say in 100 years, your government says, you know, we don't want any overweight people in our, in, in our country. And we will give you therapies that you don't even know you're getting. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a small L libertarian, a Thomas Paine libertarian. So the question then becomes, what is security in the context of your, your, your biological um, information, your DNA? That's probably the most sacrosanct of all information. It has no uh, social security, uh, no address, nothing attached to it. So what is, this, what is the context of security in that sense? Of course, there are sovereign issues. Uh, I've actually talked with a couple of militaries that are looking at the genome, human genome as a weapon. Let's say some country decides, oh, I want to get rid of all uh, a certain kind of, you name the ethnic minority or majority, doesn't matter. Uh, it's actually easier on the Asian side because uh, if you go back you know, millions of years, uh, there were three or four branches of human uh, or human race. Uh, Neanderthals, of course, we, everybody sitting in this room has uh, two or five percent Neanderthals. You know. uh, there's uh, these, these uh, even earlier branch of humans called the Anisopans. In fact, most of the Han Chinese and Oceanians uh, in Australia are, are part of the Anisopan branch. They are very susceptible to diabetes, for example. So uh, the context of militarization of the human genome is also an issue. And what does security mean in that context? Are you part of that? I am. What the? <laughs> 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 the, the introduction is still going on. I didn't know when it started. You're already my apologies. Oh, is it my turn? No, I'll leave that stuff uh, later. So. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so my apologies. That's OK. The people here. You guys can sit down, but there's more than two now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I was waiting for the opening remarks to finish, but I'll give you a look. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know the context. So it's okay. yeah. We made our own. Um, yeah, you guys started it early. They're still talking over there. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't know the context of this. That we're supposed to all move here. Oh, yeah. I guess you guys can carry on. And there's no people here, so it's pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. We'll get the end of the discussion later. So, uh, I'm sorry about this. That's right. <laughs> So the question of militarization of the genome is also an interesting healthcare context. Of course, you cannot understand um, uh, 
the genome without understanding healthcare. So I'm not going to go through it, through it in the biology, but if you don't understand the phenome, the functions of what genomes do, basically build proteins, uh, you cannot understand the healthcare context of this. So um, we will get into a world very soon where um, if you thought it was scary today, it's going to get a lot scarier and long. And unless we have systems that manage this, both from a sovereign level and from an individual level, in fact, the Supreme, Supreme Court just negated the uh, genome patents. You cannot patent the genome because it's biological necessity. So, uh, so that was the context of, of what we're trying to do here. I'll, I'll introduce a couple other concepts here. Uh, so what's funny here, I don't think you can see this. So your health data, uh, your, the most accurate birth and death records, do not come from your medical record. And that's a fairly scary concept. Uh, your, your most accurate health data comes from everything listed here and more. And Google and Facebook as well. So there's free phenotypic information out there. Uh, so what's scary about this is none of this outside stuff, outside healthcare is government. Hi, welcome guys. I'm sorry we we uh, just got off. <laughs> we'll probably wait for two more minutes here. So. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you, you guys can hear me okay? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Oh, maybe I should bring my special idea. Oh, you might have to run it. I should have to Uh, I think this was a girl, not a woman yet, was pregnant 
uh, about four weeks before even she moved, uh, just by her buying habits. So uh, apparently people who get pregnant, uh, but they don't even know this, uh, they buy more uh, cotton balls. They buy more calcium and magnesium supplements. Um, and, and they buy more tissue. And this is just incidental information that's extremely relevant to healthcare. And that is the context of uh, your healthcare information being mined from completely different sources. So what is the context of security in your own healthcare systems? Uh, in the 1960s, late 60s, early 70s, before the first credit cards that came out, uh, Diners Club and American Express, um, ever since then, the Fordham company out in Arkansas has been mining our credit card data since the mid-70s, uh, more than 30 years now. Uh, and in fact, he had a come to Jesus moment and he actually now released all that information. You can find, go find out who you are by going to the website called aboutthedata.com. So if you just log into this aboutthedata.com, you can go see you know, what kind of person you are and so on. It is scary stuff. I mean, you can infer a lot of things from relational information, not correlated from other things. So what does healthcare security mean in that context? So uh, people talk about data sharing quite a bit in the healthcare field, that the more we understand population level healthcare, the better it becomes. Unfortunately, in the United States, um, uh, most states sell your anonymized healthcare records, even at the state government level. My home state of Washington uh, is one of the most riskiest because you can infer, uh, even if the data set is anonymized, you can infer, you can reverse engineer uh, where you are within I've talked to some very smart people who say you can reverse it near this within a 20 square block area uh, of where this stuff comes from. Uh, and again, uh, so 12 US, half of uh, our, our states sold data. Uh, 12 of the members are the most agreed. I, I didn't make this up. It's actually some pretty serious work that's been going on, a lot of data privacy yeah. So again, the question, there's a myth of uh, decreased uh, knowledge and information sharing, but also comes with it some some other side effects that, that you know, you know the, the corporation is a company in the United States. A corporation is a person in the United States, right? I mean, you heard the Supreme Court uh, decision today that you can give as much money as you want to your political parties. It's first amendment. So, corporation is a company, is a person. Massey versus, I think, Rail, 1857 uh, case. Uh, so, here are some other uh, very interesting facts. So, since 2009, uh, there were about 30 million data breaches of individual patients uh, in the United States alone. Uh, I just, I, I compiled this kind of list. Uh, There's a running list. In fact, two days ago, uh, I won't mention the name. No man's names are mentioned here for obvious reasons. You can go to this public domain name. Uh, there was a hospital in Washington State uh, who was hacked. So they had an email phishing scan. So the parent company, you know that hospitals are, are consolidating quite a bit. So the parent company, uh, uh, apparently, somebody sent an email that that's supposed to have come from a parent company in the hospital that said you need to re-log in all your information. So the, the scam guys were, it's a, it's a man in the middle attack, they pulled all the information in, and about 12,000 records, uh, patient, individual patient records, were stolen. This was two days ago, not April, so, um, uh, and you can see that the, so 30 million records gone, that's actually what's reported. We don't even know how it's not reported. Um, and every breach, uh, every this is a data breach, it's called a data breach. Every data breach is going to average about two million dollars on. So the question then to my panelists later on would be, you know, how do we build a system out there in the cloud that can manage this kind of uh, uh, inter interface, if you will, to the uh, to the physicians, to the patients? Because there are laws that you have to give data to the patients. That's actually quite. Every state has its own regulations, so we are kind of a uh, jumble of regulations as well. Uh, so you can see that there are some very insidious things. So uh, people screen scrape stuff from uh, from the computers. They're actually employees in the healthcare organization. Uh, uh, so when you when you scan data in a in a, uh, in a scanner, they still actually scan and scan and fax. By the way, that's 80 percent of the workflows in healthcare systems. Uh, unless you're in pre prescription, it's slightly different. Uh, there's actually a hard drive that sits there that takes all that data in. So but, uh, and most hospitals only lease these uh, photocopiers and scans. And it has to go back after a while. And you know, some, somebody took that hard drive and sucked in. Is that a real case of this concept? I won't tell you the name. They must find them in too. So I mean, these are real cases. And the scary part is 96% of all healthcare institutions 
will be breached. So in other words, if you're a healthcare institution, you will have data. There's no other way around it. Uh, and the question then becomes, you know, how do you prepare for this? So, quick summary of where it is. Uh, this is my confusing all of the audience slide. There's a, there's a whole lot of regulations around this stuff. Yeah, especially in the cloud, uh, there's even more. In fact, all the CMIOs I talked to, they're very skeptical about going to the public cloud. Uh, and then their question to me is, should I be worried about the NSA or should I be worried about Amazon and Google? I don't know if there are any Amazon and Google people in the audience. But, I mean, there's a question to ask there as well. In, in terms of who is actually mining your information. Is it our own government or is it our, is it our uh, ISPs? So I'm, I'm going to skip this slide. There's a lot of regulations, but you can generally put them around access control, audits, data identification, re identification, data integrity, which is data address and movement, and then transmission security. So uh, I'll kind of leave that there. So we have our panel here that um, I would like them to do a very quick introduction. These are guys that are experts in the field. Um, Andy Mann, CA Technologies, uh, Chris Baum in the corner, uh, Clear Data, and Bart Tiger, a gentleman this day in New York City. Do a quick introduction. I would ask you the first question, and again, you can jump into some fireside chat on my people here. But, um, you know, who you are, who you do, and what do you think is the biggest issue in the short term and long term? As you see. Absolutely. Um, I don't know, do I need to use a microphone? I, I think I have a voice. Um, so my name's Andy Mann, I'm with CA Technology. So CA Technology is a, a multinational vendor of management and security software. I work with uh, the office of the CTO there at CA Technologies. Um, so our company, I work very closely with a lot of CIOs, IT leaders in a range of fields, including healthcare. I wouldn't class myself as a healthcare expert, but I do a lot of work around security, security data, content management, movement of data and managing access and identity. I'm, uh, sorry, the top two issues you think. Oh, <laughs> the top two issues I think are uh, development of new applications and providing them with governance okay. and you know, the requirements to secure. Uh, when you're in the process of creating new applications, you want to get them out fast, but there's sort of a, a technical debt in terms of security, audit, compliance. Uh, that's one of the big issues. The other one is, um, yeah, securing from penetration. Uh, making sure that the, the, the malicious actors, whether intentional or accidental, are not able to leak these large volumes of data that can then be mined, aggregated, and used maliciously. I think that's one thing to I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I also have a loud voice, although I'm starting to get walked on by the uh, folks in the, uh, in the back. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer. Yeah, I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Firehose. Um, we are a secure infrastructure as a service provider. I've been in the IT and IT security business for about 25 years on a variety of roles, a lot of them technical, uh, several years in the audit space. So uh, when when he mentioned that if you're a healthcare organization, 96% of you will be breached, um, I've done some audits of some healthcare organizations that um, quite frankly frightened me <laughs> of some of the information that I was able to to see uh, and a lot of it I think just has been a result of the networking and the trying to make um, medical practitioners jobs easier um, so I think you know I'll agree on, on one of the top two with Andy application security is a huge issue right now um, you can have all the security around a um, a server or an infrastructure and have all kinds of perimeter security that keeps bad guys out. But what is the application? It's the front door of your house. Um, and you're going to allow people in. So if you don't consider all of the security ramifications around your application and application development, then it doesn't really matter what else you have in place. Um, you've, Kind of lost the battle. So I think application security is one, and I think the other is an awareness of um, of the interconnectivity of all kinds of devices and the information that they convey. Uh, I did a couple of audits of uh, teaching hospitals, and the shocking thing that I found was from literally from a, a wireless network that all the students had access to, I had the ability to see and enumerate critical care systems in the ICU. I mean, I could see everything. And I think what's happened is, is that in the medical profession, 
especially, these devices all used to be standalone, right? You know, nurse would go into a room, there would be monitors and uh, other devices that would be hooked to a patient, and that was the only place where that data resided. They had to go in and either read from a, a display and copy something down onto a paper record or something like that. Now, these are all networked and connected, and you go into an ICU now, and there may be a single nurse's station monitoring four rooms. And all that data is coming in, and I think people have just lost track of the fact that with all this data and all this interconnectivity comes risk. And, and then the other, the, so I think it's that interconnectivity. And I'll, I'm going to throw a third one in, and that is a lack of attention to what goes out of your network, leaves your network. Almost every data breach that we see and gets reported could probably have been stopped if the company was paying more attention to data leaving their network and had a better idea of what should be leaving and we're doing appropriate monitoring and control of that. So I think that's data exfiltration um, is, is, a, is a big issue, but it's it's around people just not paying attention. I get a lot that's coming in and I don't really care what goes out. Um, I'm uh, Chris Bowen, uh, founder of Clear Data Networks, uh, purpose-built company, uh, venture-backed by Northwestern Silicon Valley, uh, Excel Venture out of Boston, and the Organization Health Fund for Work. Um, purpose-built because we built the company to uh, find a place to store data in a healthcare environment. That was the whole point of us creating the company. Um, my job is Chief Privacy Officer I'm also the accountable chief security officer on paper for the purpose of who's going to hang when <laughs> somebody screws up somewhere. So, uh, so we, we have a, a whole uh, uh, information security team that focuses on the depth that I think your lens is current upon um, security and, and that kind of uh, effort. My focus is also on the privacy side uh, of, of analyzing the data flows that come in, analyzing the data life cycles that come in, drafting the privacy um, safeguards around those stages of the life cycle, uh, both from the U.S. and the U.S. perspective, they the one that I And then, of course, I also run a professional services team that builds specialized applications around the healthcare space. So, for example, ACOs, population health management, um, really considered on the leading edge when we started that with uh, one of our biggest clients, Community Health, on developing some networks in California, Arizona, and other places, uh, as well as patient and consumer engagement within the healthcare space. Uh, we also do a lot of audits, 250 or so a year. Uh, and someday I'm going to publish a book called We Can't Make This Stuff Up. <laughs> 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 Yeah, we could probably collaborate. I've got a lot of stuff. Can't pick it up. No, you can't. Um, so the, the top two things that I would think are the greatest concern, I totally agree on the front door, to your data set. You can put your data set in the most secure net back here over the right course and forget to worry about the security of the application on the front end. Have a cross-site scripting attack, or a SQL injection, or whatever, and go right into your data store. Um, so I, I totally agree with that. That'd be concern. Another one is really consent. So if you're talking about big data, what I see a lack of is, is how to handle the consent to use your data for what purpose. So again, around uh, around the healthcare space, how do you manage these massive amounts of, of data, these records? And, and figure out a way to store, understand how that consent is given to use your data for what purpose. And so you really have to think about how to define your terms, your net, your notification privacy, all that up front, so it's broad enough so that you can actually use it down the line. Thank you guys. Um, can you hear me? So um, I'll, uh, I have a couple of questions, but I'd rather just be a participatory uh, arrangement. Uh, so uh, I'll pass the mic around, and uh, if anybody wants to wants to uh, have a, has a question now, you can ask. Otherwise, I have a couple of uh, pretty short questions. Uh, so raise your hand, and we'll go in order. So uh, if you guys don't have any questions, I have a couple follow-on questions. Uh, the, the first one being uh, wireless security. I mean, you guys all mentioned this. Uh, so I, I would like to ask you your engagements. Uh, 
what percentage of the network uh, can be in, in ratio of the percentages uh, you see are wireless, and I'm sure you've seen the 60 minutes uh, uh, piece about uh, Dick Cheney, our, our past vice president. Uh, not past, it's in past. Uh, anyway, so, uh, uh, so there was a very Pardon me? <laughs> 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 Thank uh, uh, So, um, I don't know if you know the context of that. Uh, he did not put a uh, defibrillator that had a wireless control. Uh, a physician had to be there manually and physically adjust uh, the changes to his uh, pacemaker because he thought that people could hack into the wireless network and, and kill it. Uh, by accelerating his heart rate, by causing atrial fibrillation. So the question of uh, wireless security comes up quite a bit. Uh, there is uh, there is many different standards in wireless uh, the wireless formats themselves. You know, A, B, N, D. There's a new one coming up. Uh, uh, so where do you see uh, your customers uh, engaging with uh, both uh, wireless networks for the clinicians and I have working hospitals as well, and now wireless networks for patients that they can bring their own devices in uh, as they're sitting there uh, uh, operating uh, in their convalescent convalescence room, if I can say that right. Uh, and just surf the net. And so, uh, can you take this? Or, uh, well, it's interesting you mentioned the Dick Cheney thing because I don't know, um, last summer at Black Hat there was a presentation that was going to be given by a, a famous hacker named Bob Barnaby Jack. Um, who his demonstration was remotely shutting off a pacemaker and he tragically passed away that week before his presentation and at the time there was some cons conspiracy theorists out saying <laughs> there were some people who didn't want him to to uh, actually demonstrate that but, but the, the Dick Cheney was, was that based was on the real that was the incidental DNA stuff I was talking about right. polonium stuff and uh, yeah. talking yeah. that this, is, this happens but, but I think, you know, from the, the wireless perspective, and it, I'll drive it back to the application. Wireless is here. We all know everybody's got a, a smartphone or a tablet. Um, we know that, the, that they're trying to use them more and more in the, uh, the clinical settings. Um, it's awkward for there, there to be a, a computer in the room and a, uh, you know, somebody to log on to that. Docs have pre privileges in multiple hospitals and in their, in their own clinics. They're not going to check out an iPad at, at every place that they go to do that. They want their device with with access to data. And so when you start looking at that, and, and it even goes back to some of these other medical devices, there are strong security protocols that can help encrypt wireless transmissions. And I think by and large, most organizations are taking advantage of those. But again, I think the issue really goes down to how do you allow access to the data? If you're going to do it from a mobile device like a, a tablet or a smartphone, how are you writing that interface, that application interface, to restrict what the the person who's accessing that data can actually do with it? Can they just view it, or is that data actually becoming resident on that that mobile device? Because there's a, a lot of difficulty uh, uh, in, in in properly encrypting those devices and ensuring that. That they don't, you know, that, that, that personal data versus your data, um, you know, there's a separation of it. So I think it goes back to application development to make sure that if you're going to provide it via wireless networking, great, there's good security protocols. But make sure that you have the right controls around what access to that data really means, you know, and, and essentially preventing any data from residing on that on the device. So when they they close out the session, if they're, even if they're reviewing some sort of a radiological image or some sort of medical image, it's rendered on the screen, but when they go away from it, it's gone. There, there is no artifact of that on the device. And, and, and I'm seeing a lot of people, folks don't pay that much attention to that aspect of it. Chris, uh, um, I'm sure Amy has a lot to say about this as well. Uh, but it really gets down to BYOD is a big part of this. So wireless we actually had a, a doctor call uh, complaint uh, why couldn't uh, access his EAD program at Starbucks without using a uh, VPN connection. And that's going to be Not to mention the crying eyes over the uh, EAD. 
Anyway, uh, so it gets back to also monitoring those mobile devices, uh, ensuring that you have a good way of eating, which is what we're seeing the trend to be is, to, to Kurt's point, I want to use my own device. So how do we secure it? How do we monitor it? How do we uh, take a look at the exceptions happening on the ingress and ingress of the data and what's going on with that? And then just common sense. You know, use the password on the device. It's amazing how people don't do that. Uh, we, we had another client lose a, a, a phone. And the first question we asked was, well, you, you know, assuming we have the password, right? And of course, you set the up the white face and the box sitting beside it, and it's like, no. <laughs> And it was a sad thing because you know, now we had to go through a whole bunch of to this client because we just didn't want to do And you know, we think of, um, I think the BYOD thing, the smartphone, uh, tablet, is very important stuff. But we think of BYOD as just smartphones and tablets, but I think especially in healthcare, there's a growing movement towards other kinds of devices. And especially for diagnostics um, and clinicians and so forth. And connectivity via wire is just a Right? It's difficult and people want to go to wireless for some of the devices in the, 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 the rooms, for example. But also for some of the new diagnostic devices, the very small, you can swallow, you can swallow tablets now which will give you all sorts of readings internally. And that will actually transmit that data. Um, they're working on right now nanoscale diagnostics which actually end up in your bloodstream uh, and there's you know, patches you can put on which start to sample DNA uh, and start to get to some really complex levels of, of data. And it's all going at once. And it's not just Wi-Fi either. So we're seeing, obviously, Bluetooth, uh, proprietary protocols like ANC Plus. Um, there's a whole range of stuff. And just for one factor an example of where this becomes a problem, I was talking to the CIO of the NFL uh, just over the last couple of days. And they're doing a huge amount of work on player biometrics um, to figure out you know, if players are being effective, if they're being affected by heat, um, you know, when you should pull them off the field because they're not fit enough to go another play, for example. And the question becomes, okay, how do you protect that data when it's being transmitted? And how much of that is actually healthcare data as opposed to sports coaching data? Um, so there's all sorts of issues around that wireless transmission that, that go beyond the smartphone and the tablet, and even beyond Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to a bunch of new transmission standards. And that's a worry because, again, coming back to the idea of, well, I'm developing this application to learn about this data on my players, I'm not thinking about securing this data because that's not my primary interest. And you end up with that technical deal, and that's a big concern. Thank you. Uh, any questions or should we keep going? Oh, there's one here. Uh, yeah. uh, we just pass this on. You can have this pass it around. Uh, my name is Kurt. Uh, we are a power company focused on the home care uh, IT service. Uh, we use the variables, portable devices to monitor patients' uh, health status. We can do continuous uh, monitor, remote monitor, and uh, this uh, for the, uh, uh, for the chronic disease and uh, intermittent disease uh, and uh, for the post-acute uh, uh, patient too. Uh, uh, for the, um, I, um, we, we are the startup, we are small but we are global. Uh, we are, uh, have offices in China, uh, Canada and uh, we have work in uh, Europe or Australia too. In the uh, new devices, uh, very much, and especially for its uh, security and uh, how to make the data uh, to be useful. Especially if, uh, if the data could be steady, uh, it can be deal something uh, on the device and make it uh, small, and then we can trans uh, transfer to uh, storage to stack there and to some analytics there. It will save, save a lot of analyze of them. Yeah. So if there are any information on such topics, uh, it would be uh, great if you could share something about that. Thank you. Well, let's talk about cross-border data for us. Sure. Yeah. Sure. That's a whole session. Okay. 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 Um, what I would refer to that is if you talk about local big data, 
uh, now you need to start considering the, 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 the Data Protective uh, Act or the Directive of the EU. Germany has uh, some tighter requirements there, France to some degree, the UK, and then if we get into the Asia Pacific, a lot of the requirements around how you treat that data are somewhat bit different, uh, and you have to have certain agreements in place if you move that data across the border. So uh, if you have questions, we'll talk a lot more about that after. But understanding your application and how the data flows within the application, physically where it flows, and then if you're using a big data stack on top of that to help analyze that, it goes back to that uh, consent and also the legal requirements around how you can use that data for what purpose. So a lot of that analysis has to be done before you uh, get too far down the road so that you stay out of trouble. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's just so many things we can talk about with regard to uh, that. Data security, per, per se, I, I think applies you know, globally. It's almost like that. Yeah, and I think this whole issue of consent, it, it's a really good point. In, and the Europeans take a totally, I mean, literally polar opposite view of personal data from what we take in the United States. I mean, it's kind of shocking to see that half of our states sell our anonymized medical data. But think about all of the, you know, how many of you shop at a grocery store that has a rewards program? You know. There's so much information that, that we freely, because we've been brought up in a society where we didn't ever think we owned the data about ourselves, that it's almost, it's almost a losing battle in the United States to try to get that genie back in the bottle. Whereas in, the, in, the, in Europe, and in, to some extent in, in, in Asia Pacific as well, the concept of ownership of data is totally different. If you, you own all the data about you, you have to the, the laws are very clear about what kind of explicit consent you have to give for not only the collection but further use of the data. And I think we need to take a look here at those kinds of, of regulations to say, how can we start changing the attitude? I mean, I, I have three kids in their 20s. Um, and, you know, I, you know, being a, a, a dad's one thing, two of them are daughter, you know, two daughters, so you, you have the typical dad daughter thing. But being in security and then having my daughters getting on all these social media sites saying, oh, I'm over here partying, I'm doing this. I'm, and I said, you know, guys, what, what happens on Facebook stays forever. Um, you know, so please be careful about what you say, what you post, and even these um, check-in apps. You know, where are you? I mean, it allows people to, you, you think about what's going on. We give all kinds of data that we don't have any control over its use. I mean, when you talk about the NSA stuff about phone records, they know not only what numbers you call, but they can geolocate where the call was made from. They can actually trace your movements from your phone calls or your or your uh, digital fingerprints. So it is a, I mean, we can talk all day about the those issues, but those are just as important as the actual sort of data security issues is understanding what kind of data you're, you're managing and trying to secure and understanding how to um, protect your customers' um, I, I guess privacy rights. Um, and the, the one thing, I, well, two things I'd say about wearables specifically. Um, uh, one is to look at the, the transmission protocol that you're using. Uh, some are more open than others, right? I think we all know that. Um, you, know, you can go from A to B to G to E and what have you, and they get better and better. You go from you know, WPA, WPA2, and, you know, so look at the protocol you're using. Um, some are non-protectable. I mean, you look at something like an AT Plus, which is a proprietary protocol used in all the heart rate monitors, um, that sort of thing. That is non-protectable. It is non-password enabled. It is an open protocol. Um, I use this quite a lot. I'm a cyclist and a skier, and I use this on my, on my, on my cycle computer. Right? It's a little bit of a mundane uh, uh, description, but. Uh, Anyone riding next to me with a compatible computer could pick up my heart rate. I mean, that's not a big issue for me, but if it was using the same protocol, and it's just a transmission protocol, it's not unique to that monitor. If that was monitoring something a little bit more important, like maybe my blood pressure, then that starts to become information that someone might be able to use or use against me. Um, and as that data becomes more and more specific, then there's more and more things that people can find out about me 
and using that A and T plus, for example, is totally unprotected. So choose a good protocol to start with. The other thing I would say about wearables is look to the API and the interface that you're creating for that wearable. Um, you know, different wearables, uh, some of them are peer-to-peer -peer communication, uh, but a lot of them, and uh, this is a way I would advise anyone to develop, or especially hardware, is create an API that you can then reuse. I mean, it makes your device more flexible, more functional, uh, more expandable, so there's a lot of upsides to it. But it also lets you put security around the transmission right there at the device layer. You can build that into the API so that it understands a little bit more about uh, the, the identity of who's coming in, what their rights should or should not be, you know, anything from read write to really granular data level access. Um, and if you look at those two aspects in wearables and you put them together, you're greatly going to reduce the risk of data leakage. Thank you. Oh, sorry. So, uh, my first degree is instrumentation technology. And uh, I spent 10 years uh, reverse engineering every instrument type out there in the biomedical world. And uh, yes, it's possible if you're smart enough to know what you're doing. Even today, it's very possible to hack into anything you want. Uh, that raises another interesting point, which has already been mentioned here, is uh, every, almost every instrument now is connected to some sort of network. It didn't used to be that way. Uh, that's one side of the point. Uh, the, the other side of the point is um, uh, you mentioned China. So China actually wanted to sequence, genome sequence, a million applications um, at PGI, Beijing Genome Institute, previously called Beijing Genome Institute. I would recommend that you go read um, all the articles that a guy called Hank Greeley at Stanford has written. Uh, so Hank Greeley is an expert on uh, the legal issues of, uh, of uh, healthcare data and genomics data for humans. The final thing I want to say is um, uh, almost every country I've been to are, are drawing this sovereign border that all the healthcare data that's born digitally within their country has now some level of uh, country level protection. So all citizens of, and residents of that country uh, uh, are prevented, that data is prevented from going out. And there were some issues mentioned about Germany. And, and, uh, in fact, most countries have fairly strict laws, uh, including us. In fact, the Supreme Court has said that we own our own information as patients. So there's, there's a, um, when I, my first, my, my, my first class of instrumentation was um, uh, this guy called Lord Kelly. And uh, the, the saying was something like, if you cannot measure it, you cannot prove it. Uh, and they said Kelly was an optimist. But anyway, so uh, the, the other side of the coin is uh, there's more information today than there's laws. And again, Hank really has some very interesting points about it. The information is getting about five to seven years ahead of, of any legal issue around, it, especially in the newer modalities like genomics and proteomics and metabolomics and lipidomics and so on. Um, it's all coming to healthcare. So, um, uh, so gather as much data as you can at, as it's in the wild west because there's probably some intellectual property attached to this, which is probably what people are doing in the end. But there will be laws that are much stricter. You've not seen them. And I talked to the FDL. So, there are a couple of guys, you go to Hank really and Hi, uh, Dan Snyder. Uh, my uh, consultant practice is 42 Tech, and uh, I run a group here for SD Forum on healthcare IT. Uh, let's take for a moment uh, that uh, most people are not sophisticated enough to personally implement some of the recommendations you're making about security. We buy our smartphones, we buy our tablets, we use them. Uh, but let's take as a supposition most of us are not sophisticated enough to do everything that's needed. And we talked a little bit about regulation. There are uh, attempts, and you showed a complicated slide, uh, that there are a lot of different regulatory initiatives. But maybe the panelists could comment on what would be a practical recommendation for the industry to moving forward to take into account people on their own are not going to always be able to do the right thing. Uh, companies, uh, if they hire the right security professionals, which may be a scarce resource, they may be able to. But what are your thoughts about moving forward? How do we, as a society, deal with this? 
I'm not just say a couple of things, but you guys can jump in more than I will, but um, education, obviously. You know, education, uh, making people understand what is the risk and what are they giving up and what they can do about it. Centralizing control uh, in a large uh, medical institution, for example, in a hospital, uh, you're having the, the security professionals, as you say, actually enforce real controls. Um, and sometimes that's going to be problematic from a, a, a sort of you know, BYOD perspective, for example, doctors want to bring their own tablets in, and sometimes hospitals are going to have to stay <coughs> the client, and that's going to be very difficult in itself. Um, building security into the application, encrypting data early and often, so it doesn't matter if the tablet gets lost in any way because that's encrypted. Um, you know, there are some of the things you can do, but ultimately you're going to have to educate people to take responsibility. Yeah, I agree. I mean, education is, is huge. From the, the individual perspective, you're right. You know, I had a conversation. My son decided to switch to an Android phone. And I had to have a conversation with him. I said, that's great. We want to do that. But here are the risks. And then, of course, the first thing is, well, I'm going to jailbreak my Android phone. And I'm like, you know, um, I, you know, there's some more risks. And by the way, I'm cutting you off from our family plan because I don't really want to have anything to do if you're out there doing that. Um, so there's very, you know, I think there's some basic things that people can do, and I think the device manufacturers are getting better at building in security things that are easier for them, for you to implement. I mean, in the latest version of iOS, there's much more, you have much more control over uh, data, you know, privacy notifications and what applications get access to different parts like the microphone or different, or your contacts. So there is some of that, and, and I think there just needs to be more education. But I think it really needs to be the industry as a whole needs to take a look at how do they manage this data and how do they protect it because they're the source of it. I mean, you go to the doctor's office, if they're going to give you access to a patient portal so they can post your lab results or things like that, it's up to, it's, I think that it's incumbent upon them to provide that data to you in a way that's easy for you to consume but also in a secure way. And, you know, the regulatory landscape is, is complex and I actually sit on a public policy committee for an industry lobbying group and been out to, to Washington several times. Um, and I'm not sure that legislation is always the right way to go. I mean, even you look at some of the, the national, you know, the, the Canada's got strong data protections, uh, Germany, this whole idea of the data can't leave the physical boundary of the, of the country is, is ludicrous in today's society because physical geographic boundaries have no meaning in cyberspace. Um, you don't really know where things are. Um, but you know, the other thing that that, that, that brings in is, is for the very large companies like Google and Amazon who have large global presences and whose models, I mean, you look at what Amazon did early on, and they, they sort of pioneered was, you never knew where your data was. If you, did something in the Amazon cloud. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere in the United States, it could be anywhere overseas. They responded to market pressures to build what they call now availability zones. So now when you go contract with them, you can say, I want my data to be at least in this geographic zone. You don't know exactly what data center is in. But from a consumer or from a from a company perspective, those are some important questions to ask your providers. Can you guarantee me data sovereignty? Can you absolutely tell me where my data is and do I have some control over where my data is? So I, it's a complicated issue, but those are just a few thoughts. Uh, great points. Uh, I would also try to narrow your use case a bit. Uh, there are business associates, those that serve the healthcare industry from a software perspective. Um, those are the folks who we work with a lot, where we can actually help them understand what's reasonable. HIPAA, if you look at the legislation, I know the lawyers got in there and said, let's put in the word reasonable. So then we can actually have a little pleasure. Back. Education is important. I would also say that partnering with those who know how to do it is equally important. Like, like your firm, for example. Go in, educate, help them understand security, help them walk through a security review before they, they go through it, go through a privacy review to understand the data flows and how to protect that. And, and, and that's the beauty of my host of and CA, some of these other great farms that can go through and, and, and be a partner, not just to rack and stack here and put your data here, 
good luck on that audible chain of custody that you're required to have. Um, we wish you the best. And, and oh, by the way, let's look at our agreements and our contracts to see how those partnerships support what your responsibilities are when you're handling a big data set that has identifiable information that happens to be protected under HIPAA. Question back, I'll just I'll just quickly while we're passing the microphone, I'll just throw out a couple of acronyms at you. Um, think about DLP, data loss prevention, right? Understanding uh, to your point, your exfiltration of data, where it's going. Um, and look at things like NAP and NAC, right? Network access control, network access protection, about who's coming into your network. Is that device an authorized device, does that device have the security controls already installed on it? So, you know, I mean, for example, if you're using a smartphone to access your exchange server and say, well, I, I have to control your device before I give you access. Those sorts of technologies are going to be really important. Yeah. I had more of a comment than a question. I'm Jackie Lennon. I'm where security was obviously a very hot topic. And some of what was discussed was really stunning. So the expectation of what needs to change regarding security is that the follows that security needs to become core to the design of applications, and that we need to fundamentally shift away from adding security later, because that was already proven to be a problem with the internet and mobility. Uh, the second thing that was absolutely stunning and what was shared was that in looking at the top 10 IT education programs, in the country, security is either not in the curriculum or it is an elective. And so it's not a priority in the IT education programs in the country. And industry is not teaching security or design for security on the job. And so NIST always looks at the broad implications of how to influence, evolve, and try and you know determine from a technical perspective how to build new IT solutions for government, which has some of the most uh, rigorous restrictions of all. And so those are some of the things that were identified, the key things to change the way we develop applications, like we were talking about, and design security in right from the ground up. Because in the mobile, hyperscale, interconnected cloud computing world, this issue is only going to get bigger. Thank you for mentioning this. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Well, and, and no wonder we're having trouble finding good security talent. Uh, <laughs> if, if they're not even teaching it in the schools, um, you know, and you know, I grew up from with technology from sort of the early times. So there wasn't there weren't classes, there weren't degrees. You just had to figure it out and learn it on your own. But um, you're right. I mean, it's it's stunning to still see. I mean, we we publish a report every quarter on the web application attacks that we see against our customers because we have a a web application a firewall layer that protects all of our customer systems. And it's amazing to see how many SQL injection and cross-site scripting attacks we continue to see at, that are successful. Um, because it's pretty well known how to prevent those at the application side. But I've even had internally in my organizations, we do some internal application development, had to really hammer on our development group to say, look, security, you got to think about that as step one. You know, what are you trying to do? And now, what are the risk implications and security implications? So, you know, I'm glad to see NIST recognizing that. Now we just need to get the word out and get people actually doing it. Actually, I, I, I do want to shout out to NIST. Uh, I, I used to be uh, involved in HL7 gateways many, many years ago. I used to be in the DICOM party in the 90s. But, um, NIST is one of the first people that came out and was actually qualifying cloud vendors and cloud provider and internet server providers it actually in the early 2000s. Um, I, would, I would encourage highly everybody, one of the best uh, treatises on the cloud and security is on the NIST.gov website. So, uh, but there's one more question here. So, yeah. Yeah. so my question is, we talk about the application security, like, which is mostly around accessing data on the fly. Uh, but the bigger problem is when you talk about the big data, and we talk about the health data, there is a big data which is residing on the rest. So, what's the uh, you know what's the guidance you know, or what's the experience you guys have in this room where you can talk about in the data on the rest what security implications you have? I guess I can uh, secure every data bit coming to my uh, to my desk, but 
that comes like a performance implication. Let me wrap that up as a different question. That's the other kind of the room question. Uh, 80, I think there's some surveys that say 80, 85% of all data is unstructured. Uh, there's only 10 to 15% that are reside in data, uh, rectangular databases. So uh, the, the elephant in the room question is the cloud. Uh, you know, how do you secure the cloud when you design normal IT networks? There's, a, there's perimeter security, there's internal security, and there's a DMZ. What does this context mean in the cloud? I, I, that's kind of the last question. I'll so uh, I'll give it to you in a second, Kirk, Andy, but, but before we get into the depth, we need to talk about the use. What are you using the data for? What are you planning to use it for? Those have real infrastructure considerations down the road. So for example, if I'm using a, some, some past data to do some empirical research around cancer rates in a zip code, or a megalopolis of zip codes, your data protection is different than if I'm going to be using predictive analytics on a personal information basis on a monitor on my wrist, where I can identify the data. So uh, legal considerations around uh, how the data is created and subsequent use come into play on the infrastructure and the application stack. I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question. It's, it's the same as, you know, we're real estate. What's the, the three most important things about real estate? Location, location, location. For data protection, especially data at rest, it's encryption, encryption, encryption. I think that a lot of times, I think there's a lot of FUD out in the marketplace about how encryption can slow performance. Um, there are a lot of products out there now that are allowing you to do wire speed encryption um, of wholesale data. And, and, and I'll, I'll make this point because I, I, I differ slightly in, in, from, from what you talked about, the different use cases. If it's sensitive data, I mean, think about the systems, the servers and the applications. What is the data to them? What do they see? They see a string of ones and zeros. That's it. They don't know, they have no concept of what that string of ones and zeros represents. <coughs> so my advice in all my security consulting was, if it, you believe the data is sensitive and needs to be protected, treat it the same. Treat all of that data with a common, uh, with a common uh, set of controls. Because if, if you're, you're, you know, a lot of people in the healthcare space are also subject to the payment card industry data security standards because you're collecting money for your services and you're allowing people to pay with their credit cards. So the payment card industry has got a very specific list of the new version is 396 discrete controls and it's full of thou shalt's and thou shalt nots. HIPAA says you will protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of, of PHI and you, will use, uh, and you will protect against all reasonably anticipated threats. And the whole idea is to conduct a risk assessment and, and select reasonable and appropriate controls. Well, what does that mean? You know, I think data is, you know, that kind of data is, is all, sh should be treated the same. The more you do that, the less opportunity there is for you to miss something. Uh, and when you talk about like big data sets, and on, on the, especially on the unstructured side, unstructured data presented a, an, an interesting conundrum because in, in the structured world, we had field levels. You could go, I want to encrypt this field and that field. Now you've got a whole data set. And it's just now transparent encryption. I think that's the single biggest thing you can do, uh, the single best control you can do to protect that data. Yeah, just I look, um, first I'll say, make sure you've got your physical security under control, right? I mean, uh, in, even encryption is pointless if someone can rip a hard drive out. Because then they can just apply rainbow tables, they can spend as long as they want to try and figure out that data. So physical security in the first place. But then understand that identity is your new perimeter. Firewalls are almost meaningless. Uh, data could be anywhere. Ultimately, for someone to get access to private data, if they're not doing it physically, they're going to go through some kind of application. And you've got to build identity and access controls into anything that can get access to that data. From the OS, through the middleware, to the application-specific content, and understand that per, the, the perimeter doesn't exist anymore. It's about identity, and it's about access rights, as long as you've got that physical security under control. Uh, one last good question, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir, Mike, back. Oh, there's two or three more. Okay, let's try and... Uh,
10 second response. So please ask your question. Go ahead. Um, what are your thoughts on using machine learning algorithms for uh, providing security as opposed to designing something that's supposed to be secure? How many of you actually employ data scientists in your teams? Like for network confusion or malware detection, do you look at your usage profiles and then try to detect anomalies? Um, we're in the business of writing software to do security, so we employ data scientists to try and figure out those sorts of algorithms, especially part of our software is about payment transaction authorization, so we can understand patterns of people trying to penetrate credit card through uh, misuse. So yeah, we're absolutely doing that. We, we don't, I mean, we're depending upon vendors, and what we're finding is a lot of vendors in this space are not, uh, you know, we're still looking at more static sort of security um, controls. We're actively looking and working with a set of vendors to try to get them to develop things that work better in the in the cloud, and you know, that will provide us that. So we we partner with Mark, one of our funders, and they have a lot of data scientists as we embark on this uh, big data play. We have the privilege of just tapping into one of them. Uh, Patrick Birch is one of the best right here. My answer is yes. Uh, we, one of our cousin companies is our site, so <laughs> we do this all the time. Uh, so uh, one last question, and we'll stop. So uh, I think right there. Is the next one. We want to stop. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and again, uh, we'll pass our cards around. If you have any questions, please uh, please go ahead and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>